When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce with Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Hello, everybody. Welcome to season four of Insatiable in our first episode. This season's theme is clarifying the issue to move forward in a powerful new way. So if you listen to the show, you know one of my favorite quotes, or if you're a client of mine is, of all times, is Einstein said, if he had an hour to save the world, he'd spend more time defining the problem than solving it, right? Part of why functional medicine, naturopathy, so effective is because we get to the root of issues, physical ailments, rather than just treating the symptoms. And I have found in my work that a lot of the personal development, behavioral change, et cetera, has sometimes not fully accurately defined the problems with many things, emotional eating camps as well. So this season, we're going to take a deeper dive look at how to really define the issues so that you can have more results, more effectiveness, and lose the insanity over some of the blind spots from the existing paradigm. So today, Juliet our original Insatiable co-host is back, and we are talking about how to end nighttime eating. So traditional emotional eating advice tells us that nighttime eating is about finding substitute rewards or pleasure. You know, take a bath or call a friend. And yeah, those things never worked for me, and it turned out they never worked out for Juliet as well. I thought I was really unmotivated when I didn't want to take a bath, but the truth was I wasn't eating at night from a lack of bubble baths <laughs> or from a lack of pleasure. I'm actually someone who doesn't need a whole lot of pleasure. I get pleasure in different kinds of ways than hedonistic pleasures. And I'm not judging people who do. I wish I could be a little bit more love and light. But I digress. But these pleasure substitutes like bubble baths or even sometimes calling a friend that doesn't always work for everyone can help get their more band-aids than getting to the root cause of nighttime eating. And because I am a root cause resolution, resolution gal, because it simplifies your life and you get a much more bang for your buck or bang for your effort, <laughs> I'm going to share with you the three root causes and the solutions that will simplify your life. Because hey, if you're going to put the effort in, why not make food and life easier and better? Enjoy today's episode, and you're going to just love the season. I cannot wait to bring you all the guests that we have. All right, guys, how to stop nighttime eating. Juliet, thanks for coming back. You always have such a great perspective, and, and everyone loves you. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're going to, this is going to be good. So I've gotten a lot of people requesting this topic and I don't know why I haven't done, or like we hadn't done it or I hadn't done it because it, I think it's one of the hardest habits to crack, like the nuts to crack. And this is the thing that I used to say to everybody. If only I could stop that one thing, then I would, everything else would be, would fall into place. Yeah. Because then you sleep better then you wake up rested and, and whatnot. But like, What happens, though, is that traditional emotional eating advice will tell you, like, okay, when you come home at night, you want, like, if you tell yourself, I deserve this, or, like, your day feels like it's been stressful, they'll tell you to find, like, alternative sources of pleasure or reward, like, take a bubble bath or calling a friend. But that never worked for me at all. What about you? No. And the reason it never worked for me is because part of my nighttime eating, I think for a lot of people, it was a way to sort of numb out from all of the to-dos that you had throughout the day. And so the concept for me about taking a bubble bath or calling someone or taking your mind off of it, going to get a pedicure, rewarding yourself with other pleasures, all that stuff just sounded like just another thing on my to-do list. And all I want to do is do nothing. (laughs) <laughs> and eating is really easy. I mean, eating is not doing nothing, but it really is a lot easier than like going to somewhere and getting a mani-pedi. 
I, exactly. And then you're like, oh, I failed at self, self-care. And then, then, then you tell yourself, oh, I must really hate myself. I really must not feel worthy. When to your point, and we'll get to that today, like one of the root causes is numbing out from some patterns that we have during the day. And so there, I think those things can be helpful, but I think they're Band-Aids. And, you know, I don't think we're eating because of a, a deficit of bubble baths or calling friends. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if you're someone like who has a job where you're really stimulated by people all day, I mean, I'm teaching fitness classes all day and I'm with people and clients and having meetings and I'm really socially engaged. So definitely the last thing I want to do when I get home is sometimes go see a friend or call a friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I get people will probably say, well, that's a menu to choose from, but we're going to get, I'm like a root cause resolution gal. You are too, because I want people to have simple, these things be simplified. So there's less to do rather than more to do. Cause I don't know about you, but I'm not looking for things to do when I'm already like tired and like oh, on the weekend. So yeah, let's get into these three root causes. Okay. So the first thing, and we have talked about this a lot, but is blood sugar control. And I think people overlook the food aspect. And I don't know about you, but I know that about 50% of my clients' emotional eating and mine too was deregulated blood, blood sugar from the day. And I was trying, and because I would eat at night, I would try to save all my calories, points, whatever I was doing at the time, not realizing that I, I I'd started to use a financial metaphor that basically if you're not eating in a right rhythm for your body or the right foods for your body, it's almost like you're withdrawing on principle all day from your bank account with a really high, high interest amount. And then you come home at night and not only do you have like not any principle there, but then you owe like 30% of what you've withdrawn. And then your cravings come back like a vengeance and you feel really depleted. And so I think, you know, we've talked about that a lot on the show, but I really think we have to Tell, let people know that part of nighttime eating is the foods you're eating during the day. Did you discover that with yourself? Yeah, because I was carbophobic for a long time. And because I had had an experience at a, you know, in my early 20s where I cut carbs and saw really great results and had weight loss and fat loss and was like, this is the thing that works for me. And then, of course, you know, over time, your body changes, your, your hormones change, things things that once worked don't work anymore. And even though I was holding on to that low carb mentality for so long and my lifestyle changed, my body changed and it wasn't working. But because of that, that depletion, I, it was affecting my blood sugar so that at night I was craving carbs, sugar, and then it would just make me feel like such a failure because I, you know, why can't I stick to the plan? I'm so glad you brought that up because so many clients, when we private, truth with food, whatever, I'm working with them, when we, I have them do an experiment where they take out carbs at lunch and then one of them, they eat them and they can't believe the difference when they have a really good, healthy carbohydrate at lunch and how it keeps them satiated for the rest of the afternoon versus feeling like they're hitting a brick wall, which is often a sign of of not getting the right macronutrients at lunch. And I just want to say, because I do still see um, private clients for nutrition, and I've been having a lot of clients come to me lately with asking me about the ketogenic diet. Oh, and, it's so, so popular. <laughs> yes, I know. And, and intermittent fasting, which I think that some people do both of them like together. Mm -hmm. Because when I always talk about blood sugar regulation and I talk to them about having a carbohydrate at lunch, they, you know, then they question, well, I don't understand why is this ketogenic diet, you know, the thing to do right now and everybody's seeing such amazing results and there's no carbohydrates practically in that diet whatsoever, you know? But what I always say to people is sustainability. I mean, that is an extreme diet. And unless you're doing, at least in my opinion, unless you're doing that for a medical purpose, you know, to help heal yourself from, from some sort of disease or um, neurological disorder. And then, then some studies have shown that cutting carbohydrates significantly can help with brain function, things like that. But if you're just looking to live your life, you know, every day with energy and try to lose some extra pounds that you don't need anymore and, you know, feel better, that is such an extreme to go down that is just another fad diet if that's what your purpose is, is you know, weight loss, it's different if you're using it, again, for medical reason. But if you're just using it for weight loss and to feel better, I, there's no reason to go down that road. And you know, one evening with your friends at a restaurant, and you're going to blow it because what are you going to ask for? Can I just have cheese off of a pizza, please? <laughs> 
Well, and you bring up a really good point. For those of you listening, there's a time for what Juliet and I would call a healing diet, where if you're in acute distress, like I just watched The Magic Pill, a client recommended it to me, and I really liked it. It was about a, they had three different people who were basically trying out the ketogenic diet. But again, they were also cleaning up their diet overall, right? So a lot of times when you see these miraculous transformations, it's not the specific diet. It's that people have gone from processed foods to eating real nutrients. But there's times like if you're someone having seizures or you're having, if you are like type two diabetic, that that diet I think can be, to your point, be helpful for a certain period of time. However, the body is pretty resilient and self-correcting. So like if you have type two diabetes and then you put that in remission with the ketogenic diet, you have a new normal that now you may need carbohydrates. And so I think that's a really important point for people because yeah, keto is so popular right now. But I know people who have done keto and now they're off of it and they've gained all the way back and then some because then it becomes not that you did the ketogenic diet, it becomes that you did a diet that was basically starving yourself. Exactly, exactly. So I always have people look at different sides of the coin when it comes to, you know, questioning the different diets that they hear about because there's always one that's gaining popularity. And that seems to be the one that everybody is coming in, in to my office and asking about right now. Yeah. And we did an episode, Juliet and I did an episode with Maria Emmerich, which who is one of the leading keto people. Halle Berry retweets her stuff, <laughs> my sister told me. So you can check out that episode. And then also episode 39, we talk about what diet is best for you in blood sugar stabilization and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's a continuum as well. Like some people come home and they just feel like they need something and they're like, oh, that's me being weak or willpower. But that's usually your blood sugar slightly off versus if you're coming home famished, then it's really off. So just think of blood sugar resilience and stability on a continuum. So that I think clears up about 50% of nighttime eating. Now, the other two causes. The second one is emotional depletion. And depleted is different than tired. Tired is more like I didn't get enough sleep last night or like yesterday kicked my ass. It's kind of like a one-off event. But most people I know are, are basically chronically depleted. And I think of this as chronically leaking fulfillment. So to Juliet's point about, you know, we don't think about just when you're numbing out to eat at night, which is definitely what I was doing when I was nighttime eating. I would eat really well and then like, convince myself I could white knuckle like a little one serving of coconut ice cream or one brownie, but then like one would lead to two, two to three. And, you know, before you know it, you're, you're like, okay, diet starts tomorrow. But the absence of numbing out isn't just calmness, it's fulfillment from your days. And I think oftentimes we've normalized kind of just getting by, just accepting that stress happens Versus looking at interactions in our day as giving us back energy, contentment, and happiness. And I want to put an asterisk here because this doesn't mean that your life doesn't look great on paper. And I think this is what confuses people sometimes is, well, I have a job, I have a great relationship, I have kids, or I really, I should be happy. We're going on vacation tomorrow. Life is good. Mm -hmm. Yes. But there's an emptiness there. And people think that weight loss will often solve that. But it's, it's really that in our day-to-day -day, you know, micro actions, they don't feel as fulfilling as they could be. And so I want to give you, again, to bring back our financial metaphor, a, a negative return on our investment because we're all putting a lot of effort into our lives. Okay. Here's the signs of depletion I see with clients. Juliet, I'd love for you to, when I'm done, if you see any, if you have anything to add or comment on, I deserve this with food, whether you're going out to eat at night or at the end of the day. Food is the highlight of the day. And what you look forward to all day is going home at night, having a nightcap of either alcohol or peanut butter and chocolate, my personal favorite. You feel like you need food or alcohol to unwind, right? You're basically getting depleted from being tightly wound. You feel unmotivated to make changes or execute on traditional emotional eating suggestions. And this isn't laziness. A lot of my clients think they're being lazy, but this is usually a mix of not being clear on what would actually help you and avoiding trying things for fear of failing or being awkward or because maybe intuitively, you know, that's really not going to solve your issues. Like, like writing in a journal may not be help working for you because you're just <laughs> reviewing the same thoughts. That's, that's what would happen with me. I would try to journal and all I would do is spiral into how much I wanted to lose weight. Evenings, this is a big thing. You were talking about numbing out. I see with my clients, they're questioning, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? What was this person thinking? Um, did I complete that enough? How am I going to finish all the work I have to do by tomorrow? So there's a lot of doubts that come up at night 
um, that we kind of just push through during the day. But I know when you're depleted, then all of those doubts are magnified, right? And that's what, why nighttime is so treacherous. It's kind of like, you know, if you get four hours of sleep versus eight, but nighttime is like, if your battery level is at like two versus eight, everything feels so much like you're, the doubts kick in even more. Well, all the distractions are gone because you're not at work, you're not with the kids, you know? So like you said, all of those thoughts start to come into play. And then a really easy way for people to just diminish those thoughts, quiet those thoughts is by grabbing some food. So temporary because the thoughts come right back. But then there is a chemical thing that happens to, for most people, sugar, right? Whether it's in the form of a potato chip or it's in the form of ice cream because it's all releasing the same thing. So those chemicals then come into play and you do feel a little bit rewarded and better at the, while at the same time feeling like complete shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I want to be clear here because one of the things that we go over in my Why Am I Eating This Now program, which is available now, to purchase and enroll in, it's not necessarily the emotions or the doubts themselves. It's feeling powerless over them. And by powerless, I mean that we don't have any choices in the matter. Like we start to think, well, this is just how life is, or when are things going to change? They've always been this way. And they feel powerless because of the patterns of how we're viewing the situations that, we're, that are having our doubts or we're numbing out with. So there's three patterns that I want to go over. And we, we talked about them a little bit on the depletion episode that we did, Juliet. But this is also, again, why we overeat at night. It's not the emotion itself, but it's feeling when we were viewing our day, I don't have any choice. I have, I have black and white thinking around things <laughs> or all or nothing thinking or, you know, it's either perfection or imperfect and either choice doesn't look good. So I want to go over those. But what was your experience with your nighttime eating and kind of like what your ritual or routine would be and like how you finally cracked it? Yeah, I would say that it went through some phases because it originally started as blood sugar, you know, imbalance. And like I said, not eating the right things during the day. So then feeling like my body needed to make up for it later on in the day, especially with how much I was exercising. So I was over-exercising at that time in my life. And so my body really needed those carbohydrates and it needed to be refueled. And I kept putting the wrong macronutrients in. And then at the end of the day, my body was like, okay, you've got to, you know, get it all back. And then that sort of started, that created a habit for me. So then the habit was really hard to break, even when I got my blood sugar under control and started eating the right things during the day. It became so habitual for me to night eat that it was really hard to kick it. And then it became more, with, had a more emotional component to it, where it was almost like a friend that I had a date with every night. And I needed to like hang out with my friend, I, you know, I eat chocolate and peanut butter and it would feel really weird if I didn't. And then the more I would resist it, the more it would persist and I would just eventually give in and just do it anyways. And so I think that we end up having it become a part of us and it's a really hard thing to kick. And there was one other thing that I was thinking that, you know, and I remember talking to my therapist about this years ago when I said to him, you know, this is the last piece for me as far as my emotional eating goes, because I'm not binging anymore. You know, my nighttime eating would, would just be a small little piece of chocolate or dessert. But why did I need just that one little thing? Why couldn't I just have dinner and be done with it? Because I wasn't necessarily craving that, you know, that sweet treat at night. And, you know, we came to this conclusion, a couple of things. One is that it was self-sabotage for me. I wanted to be bad. I wanted to feel like I wasn't being good. You know, who would I be without that? Because it was something I was holding on to. And then we decided together, my therapist and I, that who cares? Yeah, I that's can, what my thought. A little I chocolate. can eat the chocolate every night. Why do you have to not have dessert every night? And I, you know, it was so funny because I'd never thought about that, giving myself permission to have it. Because it was just something I was always trying to conquer. Yeah. Kind of like, it was like, oh my God, I, well, I have to be working and fixing myself versus Exactly. Like yeah. And I'd done so much work over the years to, to work on the binge eating and over-exercising and wasn't doing any of that anymore. And was like, I've you know, made so many strides. I look at myself naked and I don't give a shit anymore. I step on the scale. I don't care anymore. Like all those things are so incredible. It was like, but then I had to hold on to this one last piece, like the nighttime eating and 
we decided, okay, so nighttime eat, who cares? Yeah. It's not hurting you. <laughs> and so I, I mean, to be honest with you, I do still have dessert almost every night, but last night I didn't actually. And even my husband made a comment. He was like, you know, you didn't, you're not having dessert. I'm like, yeah, it's interesting how I have the choice now. And sometimes I forget. It's not even, I just forget to versus thinking about it as a, I have to. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes I still have some. Now, granted, it's, it's not the binging that I used to do. And I think this episode is for people who feel like the eating that they're doing at night is unaligned with their goals. For sure. Uh, but yeah, I, some days I do, sometimes I don't, but I just don't care about it. Like, cause it's like, I made these like cookie dough balls that are like almond, or I did peanut butter with almond flour. I think they have honey and dark chocolate chips. And I pop one of those and they're delicious. And, but I'm like, I just want this. And it's something that I like, but I don't eat any sugar during the day. It doesn't interfere with my sleep. And, but what's interesting is if I'm out, which is rare because I'm a 90 year old woman inside, but if I'm out and chatting with people, I don't need anything. It's like, I'm so extroverted that like I get that energy or that whatever from being out, but it's not something that like monopolizes my life anymore or that I have a plan for one way or the other. Like, yeah. And, and I think that when you, you know, like I, I just say like, I'm human and as human beings, we really like treats and we like to feel good. And food is, is something that is such a, you know, amazing gift that we have to enjoy all this deliciousness that is in life. And, you know, I just came back from a vacation and I was enjoying going to the local chocolate shop there and trying their chocolates and I tried their local ice cream and all of those things were by choice and not a fight. And when, you know, whereas before it was a constant battle between, I know I'm not supposed to have these things. And so me going and doing this is is wrong. And then that feeling of shame would cause me to have a fuck it attitude, eat, two scoops of ice cream instead of get a little small sample of an ice cream just to try it and, you know, and understand that that's all you really need to feel satisfied. So it's a lot of perspective when it comes to food. When you just said the key word of, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. And that's what sets these three patterns off. It's not the, the stress itself. It's that when we're worried about doing the wrong thing or that we are wrong in that moment. And these stress I call them stress responses. They deplete us and they are why we don't feel like life is as meaningful as it could be. Because, you know, oftentimes if you are battling food, again, it's, it's, I think it's an invitation of life to ask you to go deeper. Like what more can you have? What more meaning are you looking for? So just to kind of recap, to, these patterns exist during our day, the three of them. And when we feel emotions that are challenging, whether it's doubt, inadequacy, whatever, we feel that we're wrong for feeling those, especially if you're <laughs> in the spiritual communities that tell you you should have high vibes only, right? Like, okay, no, there's no hierarchy of vibes. I, I keep saying that, but I want to say it again. There's no hierarchy of vibes. All of them have a value, right? <laughs> but what happens, so the chain of events is you get a stress and then you feel worried about if you're going to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing. And it, so then you create a stress response and it frames things as you having only one or the other choice. These stress responses then create behaviors based on what we're going to go over here. And then those behaviors then create the habit to eat. So it's not enough to just try to not have food in the house or whatnot. You actually have to change the root cause of the habits that are making you feel powerless. So the first pattern is competing, okay, right? If we feel wrong, right, Juliet's point, like, should I not be eating this? We're usually comparing ourselves to what I would have done before or what I have to do the other person's doing who's losing weight or getting fit or the old me could have resisted this, right? And it's actually that comparison that causes us to lose out on enjoying the thing or feeling like we're wrong and produces the shame. And then we feel powerless. We're either ahead or behind, winning or losing, no in between. And we do this with our stress as well. We compare ourselves at, at, in our careers to the, to the woman next to us, you know, or it's always usually the woman because in a patriarchal society, we had to compete with women. I had a client once, she couldn't figure out, she would at night, she, her eating was at night, she would go on Facebook and she, would, she saw her friend got a promotion 
And she was really happy for her friend, but it sent this kind of panic in her and she started to eat. And she's like, I don't understand. I don't like, I have what she has. Like it was a promotion. I'm already at that level. Like, why am I getting so upset? And we talked about this competing pattern. I'm like, is it necessarily because of what your friend has or because you're starting to feel behind? Mm -hmm. And she was like, that's what it is. It's not what my friend has. It's I'm panicked that I'm now falling behind. And that I'm missing out because I haven't gotten a promotion in a while, right? So it comes up in sneaky ways. And it's Um, funny you bring this up because just last night I had a really similar circumstance in that, you know, I was talking to you about this, you know, before we started the episode that, you know, somebody that I work with is no longer going to be working with us. And it made, it brought up a lot of insecurities in me and, you know, what am I doing wrong? What is our company doing wrong? You know, I'm feeling left behind because all of, you know, I'm not to say that I'm like too old now, but I'm aging out of a certain like group of Mm. fitness professionals. I'm that (laughs) the next tier of age. And there's all these youngins coming in that are hot and they're super passionate and excited. And you know, that was once me because I was that age and I had all that fire. And then, you know, you, you end up having different stages of life. And so I'm in a different stage right now, but it brought up a lot of insecurity for me. And it's funny because as I was leaving work last night, walking home, I was thinking to myself that, I just want to go get an ice cream. And I didn't. I went home and I had dinner. And like I said, last night I told you I didn't even have dessert. But what I ended up doing is talking to my husband about all of these insecurities and everything that was swirling around in my mind and, and just talked through it versus just stewing about it in my own mind. And I think that that's a, a big part of it is releasing that energy whether you write it, whether you talk about it with somebody, but I think it's really important to get it out there. You hit the nail on the head. And this happens to me too in my work. Like I'm very aware that like now that I don't think the number on the scale is going to change my life, I'm still like, I have certain career goals that I want, right? And like when I hear someone else has gotten a big good book deal or whatever, it's like, oh my God, I'm like, I have a great book. I, I like I'm very confident in my work, but I'm like, oh my god, I haven't invested the time in in growing a platform and and the gold rush of the internet businesses is over. Now it's like the people who got there first, they have these huge platforms and the rest of us who are coming online, it's just going to be harder for us. And I'm not playing a violin for myself here, but just the reality is cue the it, music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great if you had production like at Howard Stern. Or we could put like fart noises in or some violin. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to find some. I'm definitely not going to get any sympathy from Carlos because he's just like, what? You have to do the work. I'm like, no, I know. But what he will let me do is just talk it through because I start to feel like, wait, there's something wrong with me that I can't can't do this rather than learning the process of what is required, right? Because it's like, okay, people get book deals because they invest in their platforms. They, they invest in doing work that people are interested in. And it's like, it's not that they are somehow magically winning and I'm destined to lose. Or, or for me, it's more being behind because I do believe there's enough, there's enough book deals out there for everyone, right? Like, but I totally get that way too. And I think I know one thing that's really shocking for my clients is just expressing that it, that it doesn't need to be fixed in that moment. And, and it's just rather just expressing that and having someone witness that and say, like, that's tough. It's challenging. And yeah, here's the reality. And it's like, oh my God, you saw me being quote unquote imperfect. And yeah, exposing yourself, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's a big pattern that we need to work on as well. This other one is avoiding. <laughs> and this is procrastinating, right? All, the, all of our avoid pa- techniques, procrastinating, avoiding it. We call it in, in why am I eating this now? And truth with food, chuck it, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, I had a client who had this habit really, really plagued her. And she would always leave so much extra work to do at night before she'd have to go back to the office the next day that she would like fall asleep with like her, you know, papers around her, her laptop on top of her. And of course a bag of popcorn next to her because, and she would say that, you know, it was, she, she said it was a way for her to procrastinate from getting the work done that she would go to the kitchen, get some snacks, go back watch a little TV, the laptop's there, the paperwork's there, but it wasn't getting done. And we, you know, one of the things we worked on was 
it was basically admitting to yourself that you're not going to get it done. So don't try. <laughs> so you're like, don't, you've never gotten it done. Maybe once in a blue moon, you know, it's always, you have good intentions, but it's not happening. So we need to figure out a different route to get it done. Cause it's not happening at night. Well, and I've had clients too. It's almost that like they'll come home from work and they've created this massive to-do list, like laundry, clean the dishes, like, you know, get all, like get the kids this or that. And part of what I've discovered in my work, and, and again, we go into this and why am I eating this now? But the, the avoid, when we're avoiding and framing, a, part of the reason we avoid is because we frame the situation as all or nothing right? I got to get it all done tonight. I got to get all. And so we have this disproportionate thinking. And so like, it's like, okay, Tuesday nights are going to be my night to clean up the house. And it's like, wait, why don't we just start with organizing a drawer or something <laughs> or like pay one bill, right? Like, don't think you have to do all of this stuff. And that's often why we avoid and procrastinate because we want to do a good job. And, but we also build it up to, in a way that it doesn't need to happen. Why so much pressure? Allie, you know, where's all this pressure coming from? Well, ugh. I mean, there's, so, there's cultural conditioning. I think oftentimes the competitive mindset, which often feels like it's running out of time, feeds into these other patterns, right? It's like, I'm running out of time. I don't have enough time, blah, blah, blah. And what I work on with my clients, these three patterns, they create so much extra work for people because 80% of the time, the sense of that I'm wrong or being wrong is perceived. It's like perceived conflict. It's not even real. If you get clear on what everyone needs and what's important to you, it releases so much more energy. But we're all like, like again, when I'm like, I'm behind, I'm like, what am I behind of? Like, you know what I mean? Who are you chasing? Yeah. Who, who's chasing me? Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will say, I had someone interview me about my, like, kind of what fear cancer has left in me. And I, I've really resolved my fear of death, I think. I, I mean, I'm not ready to go anytime soon, but I don't feel the same fear of death that I used to. But I am afraid of running out of, like, I'm afraid I'm going to die before my, t like, before I get everything done that I want to experience. Like, you know that, what you want to experience? You have, like, a list? I don't have a bucket list like a lot of people do because I just, I feel, I don't know, that's just not how I kind of operate. I do want to publish a book. I do want to license Truths with Food. I would, you know, I have like these sort of goals. There's certain places I want to visit, but it's more just like, I want to make a big impact in the world. You know, like I'm really owning that. And I feel like the work that I've spent 10 years figuring out is really impactful and can alleviate a lot of suffering. So I would love to see the arc that that takes for sure, because it's so meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. How about you? Do you have a bucket list or like, what do you, like, where do you feel behind from? Who's chasing you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm definitely, it's, you know, as far as work goes, it's like leaving a legacy, you know? I mean, to be honest with you, I'm struggling with that right now. This concept of like wanting to have more with work and have more to show for and be a part of something larger that impacts more people. But at the same point, when I was, you know, in Montana on top of a mountain last week going for a hike, I was like, who the fuck cares about a legacy, that legacy? None of it really matters. So I'm struggling between those two worlds. And I feel like I'm in a little bit of a, <laughs> like a, not a crisis right now, just I've just been thinking a lot about what's really meaningful to me in that sense because, I mean, nobody will care if, I mean, maybe they will, but it's like hard. It's right now I'm in a place of like, will anybody, would anybody really care if I have a bunch of fitness studios and, you know, if I do a bunch of t like TED Talks one day? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, yeah. how old are you again? You're I'm going to be 30. Yeah. So you're at this like interesting, if, for astrology people, the 28 to 30 yeah. is that return of Saturn. Yes. Right? Saturn, you've kind of gone all the way around the earth. You've, you've sampled the buffet and then you're coming back and saying, what's mine and, and what's not mine, right? It's a discernment time. Um, and I think I'm turning 40 in October and I think I'm going through that as well. And I, the conclusion I've come to is, I want to keep, because I'm the same point, like, okay, I want all these things, but like, you know, if humanity survives 200 years, my work will probably be built upon, improved, disproved, <laughs> like, right? It's like, I don't know. But I think what I've come to the conclusion is like, it's this idea of self-actualization over like the condition of ambition. 
And for me, I'm like, I want to know that I went for it. However, I am now unattached to the outcome because you can't control the outcome. But it took me a lot of sifting because all of a sudden, if you're like, look, if I never get recognition or I never reach the goal, what is the day in and day out work that I still want to do? And that took me several, like I thought about that. Like I've been thinking about that, like in the past. And that's kind of how I've arrived at this. Yeah, because the work that you do, even, you know, just with clients one-on-one or small groups that you do are, is super impactful. You know, the work that Ali did with me was so impactful and changed my life forever. And I know that for other people that I've talked to as well that have worked with you. So it's about deciding like, would that be enough for you? You know? Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. And, well, and it is right now. I mean, that's the thing. Although I, you know, we were also talking about this before we got on. I love that we're kind of going down this rabbit hole, but I believe, like I always look to nature as kind of a universal truth and nature always has a creative tension, right? Whether the, the, whether the caterpillar is completely dissolving in the chalice into the butterfly or the bud is trying to break through the soil. And so I do think, and I, I, this is what I teach my clients, like to me, vitality and being healthy isn't how much you weigh, isn't your diagnosis. It's like, are you alive? And are you out there kind of honoring that creative tension and that flow? And so I think in America, because we supersize everything, <laughs> we exasperate that and it has to be this striving versus what's, the, what's unfolding. Like that's kind of what I'm trying to ask myself. Like what's, I no longer have like, yes, I want to write a book. However, now I'm saying, what is life asking of me on the timing of that? What is life asking of me to do next? And so I'm trying to listen more to life now versus me leading it. And I just, I hope it's- I think what you're saying really does tie into people's emotional ties with food and nighttime eating. Because when you're not asking yourself those questions, which is really the underlying, I think- uncertainty and discomfort that we all have that we're not willing, not necessarily even willing, but not recognizing, then we reach to things like food over and over again. For sure. Cause they ground us, right? It's like, yeah. whew, and that's part of my, my third thing. So we'll, we'll get back on track. I'm glad you, you brought us back. <laughs> and, but just to kind of wrap up to the avoid thing. Also, what's interesting about these patterns is I had a client in why am I eating this now discover that she had this like interaction with a coworker that was really like, eh, she didn't love the way it ended. And her coworker was actually quite rude, but she was like, I'm just going to push through and not say anything, right? Which is really avoiding the issue. And then as she was doing the coursework, she was like, oh my God, I may have mentally moved on, but my body and my emotion is still have residue. And that's what came up at night for her. Like she, it was still quote unquote eating at her, right? The resentment, because then it was like, oh, now this interaction, next time I see this person is going to be tense because I'm still like, I didn't say my piece. So we can have these patterns during the day, but then, and we can think we're avoiding and we're, we're trying to keep the peace, but there's, you got, you got to explore it for sure. And then the last pattern is the accommodator. And this is the person who puts everything, everyone else first, set pleasant, selfless mom, there for everyone, right? And these are people who tend to think I deserve food the most. I've noticed my accommodators are the ones who, who tend to have the I deserve this thoughts the most because they definitely got some reward and fulfillment from helping other people. But again, their bank accounts dry in terms of like, where's the energy I'm getting back from all of this, right? There's a fine line between like helping people and then depleting yourself and becoming a martyr. And that can be over delivering at work. That can be going above and beyond, you know, to quote, accommodate and and put yourself into a pretzel. (laughs) So that's the other pattern that is often very depleting. And people even do this with food. Like someone, you know, at nighttime, like you're going out to eat or you're going to a dinner and the host makes dessert and you don't really feel like it, but you're like, oh, I feel guilty saying, no, I have to accommodate the guest versus saying, hey, can I take this home for another time? Or no, thank you. Like this has been an amazing event and the company and the whole ambiance is wonderful. It's not just about the food, but that's the other pattern that is big time that kind of, do you remember Debbie Ford at IIN Institute for Integrated Nutrition? She used the analogy of like 
when we're trying to hold down a bunch of beach balls, like it's like trying to hold these patterns. She wasn't talking about these patterns, but the analogy still stands. You're competing, avoiding, accommodating. You're trying to keep all these beach balls down to avoid conflict. And then at night, you're like, I just can't do it anymore. And they all pop up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you get bammed in the face and then you feel like you're drowning. (laughs) (laughs) And again, if you guys want to learn what pattern is prominent for you, you can take my quiz, uh, what's your comfort eating style at alishpira.com. The feedback on that has been really, really good. A couple of people told me that when they were answering the questions, they were like, eh, I'm not so sure. But then when they got the results, they were like, nailed it. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Avoider here. Hi yeah. guys, I'm the avoider. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a secret insatiable episode once you opt into the quiz that will give you some tools to get to the space of collaboration where what Juliet and I were talking about down that rabbit hole, but was really important is how do you collaborate with your body and your path rather than competing with other people, rather than avoiding and how do you surrender to your path and your truth and, and all that stuff um, and get to a win-win. All right. So then the last the last thing of nighttime eating, and this happens, is the transition from work to evening. Transitions are really hard for people, right? This is why all the major religions from Islam to Judaism to Buddhism to Hinduism have rituals, right? When people are born, when people grow up, when they're considered an adult, when they get married, when we die, right? There's these, they have these rituals because they help ground us. And we don't have rituals during the day or in evening. We're very like kind of Everybody wants options now, right? So we, we even like, you know, I went to this event this afternoon. It was like, I waited till the last minute to decide. I'm guilty of this too, right? Like there's no, like as much as we have schedules, we also don't. And what happens is, is we're coming from work to evening or from picking your kids up to evening. And if you're already depleted from these patterns and from your blood sugar not being balanced, if, I, if we go back to the self, a cell phone battery metaphor, if you're at like a five, and then you don't have a ritual in between this transition, it's almost like you lose charge. And so what I always tell my clients to tune in is everyone has a different level where they're not going to make the healthy choice at night. Some people can get down to a two and they can still rally. That is not me. (laughs) I need my battery to be at like a six or a seven for me to not do like Netflix and like three or four cookie dough balls. Or if they're not in the house, I just go without, which is sad, but (laughs) because I'm lazy. But this, these, the transition itself is draining and then it can drain you enough that it sets the evening up for a downward spiral. So what do you, I was curious, Juliet, what you do to transition from work to home, especially like yesterday when you were thinking that like, oh my God, I want ice cream. Like, did you have, I mean, was it talking to Mackie? Was the, the cleansing the palate, the kind of, let me, let me put, put an end, a bookend to this day. Yeah, definitely. As far as last night, that was what helped me. I would say that it's having some peace and quiet. Ah. I, I, yeah, because I'm around loud music all day and people and talking and client interactions. So when I get home, I need to have about 30 minutes of just peace and quiet. And that kind of just, okay, I'm home. I've shifted. And honestly, my house, the second I get into my house, to me, feels like a safety and so that, that to me is a transition in itself. I'm fortunate in, in that I don't have some external things that might, the others might not have. Like you might have a wonderful, beautiful home, but then you have crying children and all that. I don't have any of that right now. You know, I don't have, even have barking dogs. I have very quiet cats. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, maybe I've set it up like that, honestly, because I, I don't want a dog for that reason. I don't want barking. I'm really like revel in having like peace and quiet at certain points. So that's how I transition is just is basically shutting off for about 30 minutes before I can go back on. Yeah. Well, and I like what you're describing. And I think for anyone listening, Juliet's talking about bringing her energy back in, right? Like the, her energy was out during the day. You're exposed to all these people and like kind of coming back in and rooting yourself. Like rooting, I mean, Juliet Root, (laughs) but like all of us need to do that. And it's interesting you say that because I got a dog, you know, in January. Coffee is his name. That's, that was the name that, that came with him. But we go to the park on certain days and there's like from five to seven in Pittsburgh and the park that is across the street, all these dog owners come up and the dogs do all these runs. 
And I freaking love that because I, I, I mean, when I see clients or not, like I am actually very quiet during the day. So for me, like coming back into myself being extroverted is like going to that park and it's just like, I think coffee is the funniest, cutest thing, but being with him and just like getting back into my body, all that kind of stuff and walking over there and like meeting people who have no idea, like we don't talk about work or anything. It's like we talk about our dogs and you know, the gossip of like the park rangers are, are giving tickets this week. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> I mean, it's very innocent stuff, but I think being out in nature too helps me with that kind of transition to the evening. And so for anyone listening, you know, think of what will help you bring your energy back in. I had a client, I was just working with her. She changed her playlist from work to home. I mean, it was something simple like that rather than just kind of listening to the radio of whatever came on. It was like certain music because she's trying to work out when she gets home that like, whoo, let me bring me back into myself and get myself pumped up rather than kind of just feeling scattered. I love that. Yeah, she said it worked really well. And she then took her dog for a walk rather than just kind of letting him, because this is a big thing for people too. And I've said this on other podcasts, but I think it's worth repeating is that I had this huge aha a couple years ago is that I would say I was too tired in the evening to cook dinner or to go even to a yoga class. And what I realized was I was stagnant. Yeah, you're active all day, Juliet, but I pretty much sit in a chair except for, you know, walking coffee a couple times and getting up and walking around my co-working space. But a lot of us sit all day. And so we're not actually tired. We're stagnant. And so if we can get out and get some movement, we get energy back, right? I think of that return on our investment in terms of energy because life is really energy management, not time management. And so if you can do a ritual coming home from work to home, a ritual or something that brings your energy back in and gives you energy, you'll get momentum for the evening and have an upward spiral rather than a downward spiral. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of what, what I wanted to discuss. Do you have any more thoughts on Well, I was just thinking it's really important to put things into perspective. And oftentimes, like, our sense of self is so tied into our careers and that we can't distinguish the two. So just having a little bit more of the mentality of I'm not my job, you know, that's not really who I am. That's not, you know, that's great that you're, if you're so passionate, especially if you're an entrepreneur that, you know, oftentimes you have a brand and that can almost become like, it's hard to distinguish between you and your brand and your job. But at the end of the day, like the soul being who you are inside, it's not that. And so you, you're allowed to take off that mask at the end of the day and come back to yourself. Yeah. And I would even say, part of what you're talking about, like I always say, forget work-life balance. I think we want work-life integration and we want everything we do to be a reflection of our values. And often those stress patterns interfere with our values. We want to be the person that speaks up. We want to be the person that can have the difficult conversation. We want to be the person that, that knows what matters to us. I think that's really important piece to that of like, why not even have the mask under? And, And you have to take that That has to work out slowly because often (laughs) I joke with clients, like when you first, if you imagine taking the mask off, you just imagine you're going to like rage at everyone. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. that's pent up, like that's pent up protection. But I think you're right. And and I I have this problem with people that I socialize with that. I don't know if, if you're finding this too, where it's all about work all the time. And I have to say to them, like, can we please not just talk about work? You know, that's not all, that's not all we are is, you know, how much we're achieving and accomplishing and what's happening with our jobs and our career. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I probably, when I was in Philly and in such in startup mode, that probably was, but since moving back to Pittsburgh, like my friends from high school, they know what I do, but like, we don't talk about that at all. Or the friendships I've even made here, people have like an idea of what I do. A lot of listen to the podcast. Hello. But what's interesting, Pittsburgh is a town that's really about work-life balance And so that ends up kind of, you're on the East Coast. Uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I, but yeah. And and unfortunately, I mean, work takes up most people's time. So it's like, but yeah, you're right. Even just having different conversations about things and, you know. Yeah, because that can be really energizing to talk about something else other than the thing that is, you know, stressing you. (laughs) So totally. And and you can shift the conversation. I do it all the time with people. I'm like, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, something, anything, anything else, you know? 
Well, and I, I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of my clients and part of having their truce with food or going through why am I eating this now, it's it's having those deeper conversations and that, that everybody I think wants to have, which is why yeah. I think podcasts are so popular. We can go really deep. But once you often make the first move, then everyone else is like, woo, and so happy to come on board again a lot of these, this perceived conflict, it's like 80% of it, I would say is perceived versus someone would like, I think people want to talk about deeper things than, yeah, than whatever. So I'm glad you brought that up. So remember ending nighttime eating that's out of align with your value, with, with your goals, blood sugar balance, interrupt your stress response, collaboration, not conflict, and come up with some sort of ritual or tr- cleansing the palate <laughs> from work to home so that you can bring your energy back in. And if you love this kind of content in this episode, again, my Why Am I Eating This Now is now available to purchase. So you can go to alishapiro.com slash why am I eating this now. And oh yeah, one other thing I met, I forgot to say is I want us to get 100 reviews by the end of summer. I hate putting metrics on things, <laughs> numbers, because then it's obvious if you've succeeded or failed. But we have 79 and so 21 is not that much. I hear from a lot of you that you love the, the show. So if you could leave a review, it would really mean a lot. My goal is to get to 100 because apparently once over 100 reviews is like big time for the podcast. So I want us to be big time. Yeah. So when I'm pitching myself to other shows, it looks prestigious. <laughs> so Juliet, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Any parting words of wisdom? No can have me on any time. Oh, we will. <laughs> I love being here. Good. Well, then we'll have you back for fall. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. Mm-hmm.